Yeah, hi. Today we are looking at a book titled The Brain That Changes Itself, uh, written by Norman Jodge. Now this book really is about brain science and the revolution that's been occurring in brain science the last 60 or 100 years. Uh, so if I can squeeze down and show the topics that we'll be looking at. So we'll have a brief introduction to the author. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the plasticity of our senses and that's really about how the brain is ad adapts or is able to adapt from different inputs from our sensory organs, uh, a section on rebuilding your brain, an area on mapping and remapping and really in the last 60 or 80 years defining what part of the brain does what and it also sets the context for how plastic our brain really is. Uh, sexual attraction and love and how that relates to the brain. Uh, similarly with pain, imagination will show how closely that partners with the material brain. Rejuvenation, a section on how we grow new neurons and how we can extend the life of existing neurons. Uh, brain culture, really how culture affects the brain. Uh, and finally we'll have a last word. Okay, so if I can start with the introduction. I'll come down and get in. Uh, so the author is a research psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst and he's gone off and looked into the frontier of brain science and the frontier of brain science is all about this term called neuroplasticity uh, and that's really two terms neuro short for neuron which is really the basic building block of the brain and plasticity which is uh, referring to changeable and this really is a revolution or a paradigm shift as if you will of how to look at the brain it's no longer considered a machine or a mechanistic view it really is a pliable organ uh, which can do miraculous things and stay tuned because you're going to see some things that you I'm sure you didn't know unless you've read this book okay so if I can come back to the center So the first topic we'll be looking at is called the plasticity of our senses and this is really about how the brain can adapt to take different input from sensory organs. Uh, so looking at patients and case studies and this is really how the presentations are organised and how the book's ultimately organised. It brings things to life through case studies and patients. This patient uh, had lost sense of balance and this is damage to the vestibular system which is the sensory organ for the inner ear. Uh, what that meant was that she could barely stand up, her quality of life was very very poor. What happened for this person was that she underwent a neuroplastic miracle. Uh, and that was occur happened because she was wearing a mechanism that uh, had an accelerometer in a hat and uh, electrodes on her tongue. And if I can explain that a little bit, I've done a very crude drawing, excuse me. Uh, so she had an accelerometer on her head which provided feedback uh, and electrodes on her tongue. So when she leant forward, she got a tingling sensation on the tip of her tongue. When she leant back, she got a tingling sensation on the back and left and right. What happened is that the brain actually started taking that input and processing it as balance information so that this person could then learn to stand, run and walk and do everything that we become, uh, that we are accustomed to. Um, so what was happening? Well somehow the tingling sensations from the tongue were being processed by the part of the brain that normally handles balance, not touch. Uh, she no longer needs to wear this silly hat. She's now leading a quality life, as I said, um, that we all expect. Uh, if that's not miraculous, I'm very short on what miraculous is. Um, in another study, a fellow by the name of Paul Biowak, Paul Buckway Rector, I'm sure I'm getting that wrong, so apologies. Well, he was one of the first to uh, understand how the brain is plastic and he, to apply this knowledge in a practical way to ease human suffering. Um, but he conducted a study with blind people and really what he did is he rigged the blind people up with an apparatus on their back uh, that provided feedback that tried to project an image onto their back that they were seeing in front of them. And uh, funnily enough, what would happen there is that the blind people could actually see three-dimensionally in front of them. If you threw a ball they could catch it based on the feedback that was coming through um, uh, on the back over here. Uh, that sounds incredible. Uh, yes, a lot of these things are going to sound incredible. Uh, so another study um, and this one involving a cute furry animal and it's not the first or the last that we'll see of these um, this is the field so they work a lot with animals uh, so I'll just kind of get cracking on this rather than talk about how cute this thing is and what we're going to do to it in a minute. Um, all reasonable doubt that sensors can be rewired has now really been expelled. In one of the most amazing experiments of neuroplasticity, uh, Marenka Sir, again getting the name wrong potentially, uh, neuroscientist surgically rewired the brain of a young ferret. Uh, and so what he did here is he redirected the optic nerves from the ferret's visual cortex to its auditory cortex and discovered that the ferret still learned to see. What was happening is the ferret's auditory cortex had reorganized itself 
it had the structure of the visual cortex. Uh, incredible as it seems, the brain wanted to see and it found a way to do it. Uh, so the ferret didn't have 20-20 vision, but uh, sufficient enough to find um, an acorn or whatever the carrot, uh, whatever the squirrel's main diet is. Um, so moving on to some other co points here, um, these transformations uh, were inexplicable up until recently. Um, so prior to this work, it was acceptable to think of the brain as a machine made up of parts each of which was in a pre-assigned location, each performing a single function. And we really have a fellow by the name of Descartes to thank for this, who was born in the latter part of the 16th century, a very me mechanistic view of the brain. Um, now, this idea has really been overturned. We have learnt that it's much more complicated than that, that the brain is comprised of plastic processes that's capable of processing an unexpected variety of input, as you've seen in the last three kind of case studies. Uh, and implicit in all this work, then, is the idea that our brains are more adaptable, they're all-purpose and they're opportunistic uh, than we have pre Previously understood. No longer do we consider the brain just a set of cogs that uh, is unchangeable, but now a very fluid uh, organ, which in a lot of ways is the most dynamic uh, and exciting uh, frontier of uh, physiology that we have. Okay, so back to the beginning. Okay, so let's look at the next topic, uh, rebuilding your brain. Uh, here we are. And again, we're just looking at patients and case studies that bring things to life somewhat. So. With that in mind, Barbara Arrowsmith had learning problems. Uh, she actually had areas of mental brilliance, so auditory and visual memory were really terrific, but she had areas of retardation, especially in the spatial reasoning area. So Barbara, um, through her own research, found her problem was located at the three major perceptual areas of the brain. Now, I'm mindful of time, so it's not to break this down into its constituent parts, but here's a little model of the brain uh, in her area of issue was right in here where the perceptual areas of sound uh, lobes and the visual lobe, the spatial areas all kind of came together and joined. Uh, so significant learning difficulties Barbara had. Uh, so Barbara was a curious person and she became aware of a study by a fellow Mark Rosenwig who had studied rats in stimulating and non-stimulating environments uh, and what he found that was rats in a stimulating environment had uh, in post-mortem studies most more neurotransmitters heavier brains and the brains had much better blood supply um, and so this uh, piqued Barbara's interest and so what she did then was uh, believing that she could modify her own brain she really got cracking and she isolated herself and began a massive effort in mental exercises designed to improve her weak functions she actually it worked she successfully brought her major mental deficiencies up to a normal level uh, and so Barbara from there really now runs a school that is successfully transforming the lives of children with mental deficiencies. And the exercises that they engage in can be quite monotonous, but also they build from simple to, to more complex. Things like tracing exercises are particularly helpful. So uh, yeah, there's a, a concerted effort by Barbara to, to raise um, uh, children with mental deficiencies up to, um, to improve, and it's working uh, incredibly well. Uh, an irony alert, if you will, uh, in the past educators built up children's brains via exercises like this in increasing difficulty. Uh, you know, the fact that 19th and 20th century classical education included rote memorization of long poems in foreign languages, and they had also almost a fanatical attention to handwriting. A lot of these things Barbara is now including in her school and, and the exercise that she initially did to improve herself. Um, and, and it's always interested me because, you know, in the olden days, if you will, someone, a narrator, could always speak for 30 or 40 minutes seemingly without referring to notes uh, or uh, teleprompters because they didn't exist back then. Uh, and I'm always uh, intrigued by that. And, and it would seem now that these exercises have been dropped from modern curriculums because they're deemed boring, rigid and, uh, and not relevant. Uh, so, yeah, an irony alert, as I said. Uh, just a quick one to make sure I cover it off, which I found uh, intriguing. In study after stu study, stimulating the brain makes it grow in almost every conceivable way. Animals learn better in enriched environments. Now there's a brain chemical called acetylcholine which is essential for learning and it's found to be higher in rats that have been trained on difficult spatial problems than rats that have trained on simpler problems. Uh, so trained neurons develop 25% more branches. They're in increased size and they have more blood supply. And even in people, post-mortem examinations have shown that education increases the number of branches among neurons and an increase in the number of branches drives the neurons apart, leading to an increase in the volume and the thickness of the brain. Um, so really able to rebuild your brain. Okay, so uh, back to the centre. Uh, 